for me, it's a game. Like I compete against myself always is that I find, for, so it'd be something as simple as a spreadsheet, for example. If I complete, complete a spreadsheet in an hour, the next time I do, I want to do it in 59 minutes or less. And then with dancing, if I jump this high, I want to be able to jump even higher the next time. So it's always competing against myself. And I think that's my biggest asset is that I've never seen other people as competition. I've always seen them as collaborators. And with that, it's allowed me to pursue in an honest and authentic way moving forward rather than being someone that's seen as a threat. Welcome to Point to Rise, your podcast that gives you permission to dream big, take messy action, and turn your talent into profit while turning your back on perfection. My name is Suzanne Purcell, high performance and mindset coach, former international ballerina, profitable entrepreneur, and founder of Point to Rise, a movement designed to empower dancers. It is my mission to use my own story as an inspiration for today's generation of dancers. And now sit back, stretch, warm up, or zip your coffee and love learning how much it matters to point at yourself first to rise to all that you are capable of. Josie, welcome to the Point to Rise podcast. I am so grateful that you're here and that we finally, after I think two months, figured out how to get our sketches together. On a note that like you guys have to know, she is right now in New Zealand and it is 9 a.m. there and it is way in the afternoon here. So, so grateful. <laughs> Everything is possible. We always find a way. So welcome to the show, my love. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. You and I connected through good old Instagram, I think, was it? Yeah. Uh, or yeah. Facebook, or Facebook and Instagram. Yeah. Exactly. And we started a conversation and I thought, oh my goodness, the more and more I learned about your journey and where you're at with your mindset, um, I would love it if you could give us like a 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 <laughs> foot approach of how you became well not became but how you ended up actually reaching out to me like what was the journey uh I guess it's a long journey I think the biggest thing was is I really enjoyed the avenue that you were pursuing and I really enjoyed that you weren't afraid I feel a lot of people in the industry acknowledge their mistakes and expect people to take the same pathway as them but you provided um, a space where you empowered people to take their own steps and make a journey that allows you to be the best you and I was so excited by that and I was like I need to be a part of that I need to share my story and it kind of gave me the courage to no longer hide behind perfection and allow myself to embrace my full me mm. so tell me a little bit thank you for that that's so sweet mm. um <laughs> So tell us a little bit about where you came from, how you, you have a bachelor in arts, you love circus, you want to perform in a circus, you want to be um, producing movies and circus yeah. acts. Where did this all come from? I've been very fortunate in my life in terms of I've always had a large imagination. I've never let anyone else's, um, I guess, thoughts discourage my own um from the age of three I knew I wanted to be a professional dancer but I always knew I wanted to be more than that I always knew that there were that that wasn't a limit that I would put on myself I always knew I wanted to live in an apartment I knew I wanted to be a billionaire I knew I wanted to live in cities I knew and I'm three at this age like I'm yeah, three yeah. thinking of all these things and I've all and then I saw my first Cirque du Soleil show when I was 10 and I saw the girl on doing contortion and I looked at my mom and I said mom I can do all of that I'm gonna do that and she looked at me and she said okay and I think that's a big part of it is that I've always had supportive parents and I haven't had to convince my parents of who I am and so having that supportive background has allowed me to continue to pursue my dreams um, I did full-time dance in New Zealand for a year and then I moved to Sydney it was a very uh, fast turnover I went over for a weekend um, just thinking I'd 
get a private lesson thinking I wasn't good enough to go to a full-time school and then my private lesson turned into an audition with the director of the school and she was like I'd love to have you here I'll make everything happen all you need to do is get here and get a car that's all so she found my accommodation she set up all of my tuition and she made everything happen. I ended up with a scholarship at that school and I'm so grateful to be able to, have to study circus. I remember watching it when I was 10. I watched them perform on Australians Got Talent. So like there's America's We've Got the Australian yeah. version. And I remember watching it when I was 10 and I was like, mom, like I want to go to that school. But I never thought I was good enough. And then when I did the audition and she was like, I'm impressed with you. I was like, oh, okay. So t- two weeks later, so I went there for a weekend Two weeks later, I was living in the city. Um, So two weeks seems to be a big thing with me. Um, And then after that, I got a scholarship to another circus school. So I went to there. And then in that circus school, I produced my own show with my friends. And we produced a circus show, which sold out, which was really like exciting. And it kind of gave me that premise, like, this is what I want to do. And I really enjoyed the behind the scenes work and producing. And that's when I was kind of like, hey, I can actually use more than my body as an art form and that I can also use my mind as well so it gave me that I guess imagination again to combine the two together Um, and then after that I my coaches were like "Um, New Zealand's too small for like the talent that you have I we want you to go overseas and they wanted to send me to Europe but I was a bit like hesitant just because I I don't know, I was just, I needed, I needed like a baby step in the middle before I just like jump in the big pond. Not two um, oceans, right? Just one. Yeah. yeah. Just one first. Yeah. Um, so then I went to Australia and I went, fell in love with Global Dance Pro and I ended up working for them as well. Um, so that kind of allowed my ghost writing. I didn't know what this was. So I've always been called like a word genius. And I was just like, oh, I just, words come naturally to me. It's just didn't think anything of it like I just thought it was a skill everyone had um and then I learned that I'm actually a really good like ghostwriter and copywriter so I started doing that for Global Dance Pro um and while I was there I got an email from the Sydney Opera House stop me at any time if I'm talking oh no keep going I'm in a trance Um, I'm listening yeah and maybe Um, after you you finish this we also going to perhaps reveal your age because that makes the whole thing even (laughs) more amazing Um, keep going okay and then so I was in I I was only in my like first term working for global and dancing with them and like just living my best life honestly just I felt like I was just living on cloud nine um and then I got an email from the Sydney Opera House um and they were like we're really we've um found you Uh, it was from my show actually so a director of a circus company came to my show and she was really good friends with like the people at the Sydney Opera House and they asked her Um, who would you recommend for this role and she put my name forward but I didn't know and so I got this email from Sydney Opera House being like hi like we'd love to meet you Um, can you please send us your things Um, we're producing the show we'd love you to be a part of the creative and then we would love to have it at the Sydney Opera House and me I'm sitting there I'm a real big uh, I guess like fraud alert person like I was like am I being scammed like what's going on and I was like reading it and then I saw like the official Sydney Opera House um, signature on the email and I was like okay like this this looks really legit and so I like sent it to my mom and I was like mom like this is I think I'm gonna be in the Sydney Opera House like is this what I want to do and then I was like what do you mean is this what you want to do like you've worked your whole life for this of course this is what you want to do But with Global, I had the promise of going to LA and training with LA. And so I was sitting there like, okay, I can train in LA for three months and like get build those connections or I can perform on a real show. And at the time, like looking back, I'm like, why why was it even a thought? Like, obviously you train to get the job, but when you're in that situation and the process of training is also so empowering that you kind of forget that you're training for a job. And so I like, sat there with Anthony who um, is the director of Global Dance Pro and I was like hey like this has been given to me like what do you think and he was like I think you should go for it he's like that they first of all they sent you like it's not like you win an audition they found you and they think that you're the right person for the job and so just having that little bit of like yeah I am good like this is what I want to do and so I pursued that and then um, it was an incredible experience I'm so grateful for the people I met there and also really so when you leave full-time you feel old because like you've got the new people coming into full-time and it's like the cyclic 
I guess, journey. But when I went into this show, I was the youngest in the cast by seven years. And I was like, okay, I've, I've got a long career ahead of me. This is only the beginning. And so that gave me the courage to realize um, I can actually produce my own shows. I'm a creative person. I love choreographing. I love dancing. I love circus. And I also love all the behind the scenes stuff. I would talk to the sound technicians. I would talk to the crew and just, it was always out of curiosity. Like there was no like deep, like I want to do that. It was just like, I was just curious. And my curiosity is kind of what takes me through life, I guess, because I just want to know more. And the more I know, the more I fall in love with it. Um, and then there was a little hiatus in my uh, circus journey. Uh, I got really sick during COVID, not with COVID, um, but with, like to, I guess I got endometriosis. I had, I've got inflammatory bowel disease. And so I had to make the hard decision to move back to New Zealand and have surgery. Um, it was a $20,000 surgery. So I was like, my savings, um, but it was so worth it. And I wouldn't change it because I felt like I was given a second life. And then during the time when I was recovering, I decided to go to university. Um, I'm now studying a Bachelor of Commerce majoring in marketing and a Bachelor of Arts majoring in film and theatre and that's giving me the tools to then branch onto my next platform where I can both produce my own shows I'd love to produce for Cirque du Soleil um, and I'd also love to produce for other circus companies and then also continue pursuing um, my performance aspect. All right. That, that's me in a yeah. nutshell. <laughs> Just a nutshell. Great. So let me ask you this question. You you said you want to be a, a, a billionaire. Yeah, I, yeah, I just, I have a billionaire mindset is what I call it. Yeah, because that's awesome. For me, it's financial freedom. And for me, financial freedom means the ability to choose when I say no. Yes. So here's the thing. Most artists, anybody with a creative mind um, has a really, really hard time actually understanding that that's possible okay so where did that come from you just I think where did it come from is that I've always felt like an outsider looking into the world and so I never felt the emotions of the people around me and the limitations they put on themselves whenever someone would challenge me with, I don't think you can do this, I would be like, well, I'll show you. And it would just propel me to go further forward. Um, And with the money side of things, I just, I would get so angry, I guess is the best wording for it, that people would be like, you're a dance, dancers aren't smart, dancers can't earn that amount of money, dancers can't do this. And I was like, well, I'm not just a dancer, like I'm an intelligent human being. I have so much ahead of me. And I would always... We did this um, in full time. I remember doing creative workshops and people would always look at me like, how did you come up with that? And I'd be like, well, it just, it just made sense. Like I would, I would sit there and I'd, I'd listen to a song and in my head, I would not only see the choreography, but I would see like a music video in my head. And I would not only just see like what you see on the TV screen, but I would see myself from a director's chair, seeing the different angles of what I would shoot in order to portray a certain emotion. And then when I thought about the kind of things that I wanted to produce, I knew that I needed the money behind it. So I was like, well, why don't I just combine the two? I can't just keep saying, I want to do this. I want to do this. I need to have the backing to actually make it happen. And a lot of people have stigma against money and being like, oh, it's such a bad thing, but and money doesn't provide you happiness and all of this kind of stuff. And I was like, money doesn't necessarily provide you happiness, but it provides you with the tools to explore what you want to create. So that was kind of my reasoning behind my mindset I guess is that I never wanted to limit myself and I knew that I needed the money behind me to do that yeah okay let's let's say that one more time (laughs) you know we but particularly in the arts and I you and I talked about that and exchanged emails about that the there is such a ceiling there that it seems people just can't break through because the belief is so Oh, I don't know, hammered into toot being given f- forward from every generation. Like it's almost like an inherence that artists must be starving in order to call themselves starving. Yeah, if you have life. A, yeah, but then you can't become a dancer or any other kind of artist if your parents do not support you until you're 35 because exactly. really 
when we're looking at the pay cycle that's coming in, if you're not really in the professional world and not, not, not always, are you actually yeah. able to stand on your own feet? Um, yeah. So let me ask you that question. What do you think would make a difference um, in, in actually moving performing arts organizations into a for-profit model? I would say it would have to start with the younger generation because they're, I find that more we're progressing forward, the more the younger generation is speaking up. And a lot of people say like, we need to teach these skills in school. And I think the problem is, is that it stays there as a thought that we don't go, what is the actual program that we're teaching them? What are the actual skills that they're missing? It's just like, we need to teach them tax and so but what do you need to teach them about tax? They don't need to know the whole process. They don't need to pass that apply to the performance industry. And I think having those conversations at a young age would then allow the transformation to continue to happen and for it to be a cycle. And then I also think at the top end of things with CEOs and things like that, they need to see art as not necessarily just this creative thing that you see on stage, but I think COVID's really shown how much people rely on the entertainment industry to fulfill that void in their life and seeing it as a form of medicine, I guess would be the best wording for it, would be a better way to integrate the two together and see that it's not just a pretty thing that you see on stage with a sparkling tutu. It's actually more, it's a health thing that we need this type of industry in our lives in order for people to have that solace and fulfillment. Exactly. Even though it's not a tangible <laughs> product, right? It is not something yes. that you can put in your pocket and you take home and you unpack it. It's something yes. you go to, something you, you, you look up on the TV or on your computer. However, it evokes emotion in, other, in people. It allows yes. you to step into a world that you usually don't tap in. Yes. Right. And, I think, and yeah, and that that definitely takes. Um, well, I think the switch in in the belief of that arts can produce money, that they're only there for the rich and wealthy as an entertainment mm -hmm. is where we we can now switch our um, our minds a little bit and mm -hmm. say, hey, well, what, what would it actually look like if you were running a Bali company as a business? What is it? You wanted to add something. I think I was thinking about it like um, there's this thing going around New Zealand at the moment um, about how much the government puts towards each different, mm -hmm. I guess, event. And so like with the America's World Cup, there were like millions and millions and millions, like I think it's like 129 million or something like that put into um the america's world cup and then the royal new zealand ballet had like nine million or something like that and then there was like a moldy performance group who had only had like one million and so it then just shows how the government perceives the different parts of these industries and for so long people will say oh like it's tourism like we're attracting all of these things but with covid there is no tourism so you can't rely on that excuse anymore. So I feel like those layers are becoming to unravel and really see how people value the arts and how people value sports and the differences. Because at the end of the day, you can't take home sports and you can't take home dancing, but there's still platforms of entertainment. So being able to see it in that same way, how the sports industry can make that a profit, like why can't we do the same thing with the entertainment industry? Okay, that's, that's, this is really good and interesting. <laughs> Let's dive a little bit into that. Why do you personally think is the government actually believing that investing all of this money into the sports has uh, a better, perhaps, return on their investment than Bali does? I think it's just a bigger market at the end of the day. Like if it comes down to marketing, it's so much easier to market a sports team because, for example, if you have a son who plays rugby, you have a dad who plays rugby, you have a mum who goes and supports the rugby, and then you have brothers and sisters who are just dragged along. So that's five people in the family that you can target. Where if you go to the Royal New Zealand Ballet, how many people can you say that both parents go to the recitals, that all the brothers and sisters go to the recitals, and that they all watch ballet together on TV at home? So I think it just comes down pretty much to the target market, is that mm -hmm. there's more people that they can reach and convince with a message and then there is with a ballet and so 
I think ballet, the stigma around it and dance, they're mixed, is that people don't understand that there's more than one form of dance. Like if you ask someone, oh, have you been to the theatre? The first thing they'll, be, they'll think about will be, oh, I've never been to a ballet or something like that. They don't think about all the other shows that are available and all the other things that happen with it. They also think it's non-affordable, right? That's, like, yes. If you look at people are more willing to spend $50 on a ticket to see rugby because yes. the storyline is very simple. There's a yes. ball, that ball needs to go over. <laughs> Seriously, that ball needs to go to a certain, I, I know yeah. nothing about rugby, right? And there are two teams. And whoever does it the mo most time, they're going to win. Meaning yes. it also gives, um, there's always going to be a hero. There's always going to be a victim. Okay. Yeah. It's kind of like that safety net of knowing the outcome. <laughs> yes, it is. Right. And then if we look at, um, and it also, because it reaches all of, all of these people, it is yes. the perfect place for advertisement. Meaning that when we're giving, I don't know, $12 billion to the sports, we know that, we most likely are going to make it back and then some. Yes. Right. Yeah. But if we're looking the at Super Bowl ads, how oh, many yeah. Super Bowl ads are like billions? So five grand per <laughs> second, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, and if you then think of the arts, they're not, people can't relate. You yeah. know, they were made for the kings and queens and any kind of, not any kind of art form, but if we're just looking like broadly at um, performing arts, for example, yeah. um, originated for the kings and queens as an entertainment, right? Circus too. Yes. yes. And I, I feel like we've never really moved away from that stigma, from that story, from that, from the roots. Like it, it really needs to be uprooted. I feel like the roots need to be cut off And we need to make more new roots so that more and different leaves and branches can grow um, yeah. to understand. Let's, let's take your marketing skills. Let's talk about, because it all plays together, right? Let's talk about it is it's, con it's consumer behavior is that we need to understand our demographic. And if we don't understand our people that we're targeting, then we're just, flicking out empty messages and hoping for something in return but that's the smart thing about sports because sports is a game at the end of the day so they have they already have that game mindset that at the end of the day they want to win at the end but the thing you can gamble on sports you can't gamble on dance like oh what's like what can you what could you gamble on a dancing that one company profits more than the other but the, you can't even talk about profit so there's nothing that you can invest into <laughs> invest you can't into. even talk about profits mm -hmm. okay keep going yeah you can't like no it's just such a thing like even when you sign, like for example with your con like a contract when you get given a contract no i don't know many dancers that will say no because they're it's not worth their time like they'll rather just do it because they have a job if even if they don't believe in the company or they they'd rather they're putting their ultimate goal on hold in order to pursue something they'll just accept the contract but not many people realize that they they actually have the power to negotiate like you actually have and not necessarily like the power like I'm the best blah 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 like no. you it's just valuing yourself and understanding that you're worth more sometimes than what's written on that piece of paper like in the sports industry for example you have people fighting over different players for different teams I'll pay you this like a lot of our Kiwi players all fly to France and um I was about to say perform but play yeah. for um like Toulon in France um because they pay more and so they're given the freedom to do that so why can't dancers be also given that freedom and like don't take this for granted like my I'm a, my family's a huge sporting family my dad was like a professional boxer professional rugby player so like I know what the industry is like it's not like I've come out of this blind side of being like oh it's not fair blah 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 like I've seen both sides of it and that's I think what has given me the platform to be like why can't we just apply this model in a way that suits the performance arts industry yeah and why can't we like tap into that market like what would it look like if we would merge or um you know trade spots maybe or just build an alliance a col collaboration Collabor yes <laughs> thank you um uh, because that's how when you know that's 
that's all it takes to succeed, to really t- let your guard down, put your ego on a shelf and look what's outside of you. Look what things are really working, what processes, what the marketing is. Like, let's, let's just start in the arts. Like, who is your ideal yeah. client? Who are you talking to? You know? And, and yeah. why are you actually, what is your vision? What is your, what are your pillars of content? I think it also comes down to the fact that in the industry itself, we have such a hierarchy. Like, for example, take a cruise ship. The dancers get paid the least amount out of all the entertainers. It goes like, it'd be a dancer, singer, an aerialist. Like, we even have a hierarchy in our own system. We don't even believe in the value. No, we don't even. Of- yeah, exactly. <laughs> And, and you know what? performing artists it's not so, the cruise ships oh yeah see I like there's there's way more it's just like the easiest example and I think when we come back to content a lot of people are producing their own content now but if you think about it how much it costs to make a music video people are doing that themselves they're posting it on the internet and they're not making anything in return because they're just like, this is my art form. I want to share it with the world, which is great. Like, love that. It's the same as going and watching a free rugby game, I guess. But the thing is people take that for granted and they just keep and keep and keep on expecting it. And so I think in terms of content with marketing is that when we collaborate with businesses, we're not selling our souls, which I think a lot of people think they're doing. Is that <laughs> oh like, okay? I'm I'm joining this company. I'm I'm selling my soul. My art form is no longer my creative expression, and I think that's where a lot of the problem comes from. Is that if you partner with a company you believe in, for example, coconut water, and it's there's not much too bad you can say about coconut water, like. No studies that obviously prove this wrong, but for the majority of it, like coconut water, they make a lot of money. It's electrolytes. It's a perfect collaboration with the entertainment industry. Like, but that connection would never happen because people will be like, oh, like we can't collaborate with a company that's not dance. Like everything has to be dance related in the dance industry. You can't go, oh, I'm going to partner with um, Pump, which is like a huge water company because like they're not dance related, you know? So I think that's a lot of the stigma is that when you partner with someone and you're not selling your soul, you're just combining ideas to make something bigger. Which this is beautiful because it is such a beautiful segue in, I mean, collaboration and community is one of the pillars that is essential for success. Right. And I, I, I see so much in the arts that we are, we are the industry is, um, single siloed because there is so much fear that they would lose their donors if they were to collaborate. Um, And I I feel that a reset of intention and a a reset of why are we actually here and who are we serving um, is so imperative. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that because you are studying particularly marketing um yeah yeah. I think I was just random thought but like with sports we sell a community but with dancing we sell an art form and so in terms of content allowing people like almost breaking that fourth wall down and allowing people into it and not necessarily being that if you're industry in the industry doesn't mean that you have to be a performer and that allowing that community in, into what we see the industry would allow for more people to find a, a tangible thing that they can invest in. Um, Cause I feel like even with the corporate world, you'll have so many dancers that go into the corporate world, but they feel like they have to leave it behind that they can't dance and do corporate. So they build themselves up the ladder, but in the corporate industry, they're still known as a dancer. If that makes sense. Oh Yeah. It's when you um, become your job, I would say. Yes. You know? <laughs> and in, in, in any field, even as an entrepreneur or as a manager, if you take that on as who you are personally, mm-hmm. it never works. It just never works. It really yeah. doesn't. Okay. What's next for you? What do you see? Oh, for me? For me? Yeah. Okay. Me, uh, <laughs> no, no, not for the interview, but yeah, sure. 
Um, for me, um, I'm finishing my first year of uni this year um, in November, then I'm going back to Australia. I've got a few things lined up. Um, I'm very lucky to have been asked to be a lead in a new circus show. Um, so I'm excited about pursuing that and telling the stories of the Indigenous people a bit more. Um, that was something that I feel is another hierarchy thing in the industry is that it's always the people at the top that tell the stories and they get the money for it. So mm. being able to provide that voice for the Indigenous people is something that I honour and I feel really privileged to be a part of. Um, and then I'm also am now the digital and marketing manager for Global Dance Pro. Um, so I'll be building that um, industry and that empire is what I call it, um, more with Anthony, which I'm really excited about. Um, we actually have a meeting next week about where we're going with all of those pictures and everything like that. Um, and then I'm also lucky to work for an incredible company that focuses on health and wellness um, as an EMF performance center. So I'll be doing marketing strip strategic stuff with them too so I'm fortunate enough to have my fingers in multiple pies but loving everything that I do with them okay this is so beautiful let me ask you this question um first a statement when I talk to artists um mm -hmm. I often get oh I'm too busy for this I can only do my art I can only be a <laughs> dancer I can only be a performer um and I have no time for anything else here you are, three different streams of income, three different, and, and school. Um, what is, what's the difference? I know that I'm capable of so many things and I don't want my pathway to be linear. I don't want to be like, I'm a dancer, then I'm a marketer, then I'm a director, then I'm a CEO. I don't see that in my step. I don't see why I can't go in my own little spiral of doing everything. Yes, yeah, circle. Well, yeah, circle. because everything feeds yeah. into everything, right? Yeah. Exactly. So um, that's what, for me, the thing it comes down to is communicating what people's needs are and how I can fulfill them. So, for example, I know that I would be an incredible CEO. I know that I'm an incredible I'm, I'm a really good marketer because I understand people's needs and I understand their perspectives. However, I also understand that in the corporate world, you also need paperwork behind you, which is why I've decided to do a double degree because I never wanted, I didn't want to not be let in the door. And so that's the thing with those kind of degrees is that they provide you the opening of the door and then it's up to you to sell yourself once you're in there. And I, I don't want to sound overconfident, but I believe in myself. And oh, I think oh, that's so funny. <laughs> yeah, I awesome. believe in myself. And so I know that I can do all of these things. And I've been fortunate enough to do vision boards um, since I was about seven. My mum and I would always do one every New Year's Eve. So that was like our tradition and it's continued to this day. And like, it's always just more refining now that I'm older. Um, and I've always had that on my wall to look at. So every morning when I would wake up, I knew I had this, um, I still do, it's like a, diagram and there's five columns and each column has like the header would be like um corporate and the next is dancer then the next is circus and the next is um jme which is what i call like my own company because i i am a product at the end of the day um and then the fifth one is um like my family and what i see for my lifestyle and so each of those has like a title i guess underneath it of the different things that i wanted to pursue and there's so many things in there that if I did everything in a linear step, I wouldn't be able to achieve it all. So my mindset is, well, I'll do this. They, they all link up somehow. Mm. You can see it when you see it visually. And I think that's what allows me to realize that one stream. I'm, I'd be so bored if I only did one thing as well. Like I need to have that multiple <laughs> facets of things to do. So yeah, that's how I've kind of seen my life as being able to do multiple things. And it's like a for me, it's a game. Like I compete against myself always is that I fight for it'd be something as simple as a spreadsheet. For example, if I complete, complete a spreadsheet in an hour, the next time I do, I want to do it in 59 minutes or less. And then with dancing, if I jump this high, I want to be able to jump even higher the next time. So it's always competing against myself. And I think that's my biggest asset is that I've never seen other people as competition. I've always seen them as collaborators. And with that, it's allowed me to pursue 
in an honest and authentic way moving forward rather than being someone that's seen as a threat. Yeah, when we compete with other people, we're actually denying ourselves our own light, right? We're just not willing to see it. Yeah. And if we're not willing to see our own light, how can we actually tap into everything that we have? Um, Okay, great. That's beautiful. So multifaceted. (laughs) This is your permission for everybody that's listening and thinking that, you know, I can't be multi-passionate. We all are in a way. We just don't allow ourselves to actually tap into all of these different passions that we have and explore out of fear that I had to sign a document when I entered the ballet school at 10 years old that I will not pursue anything else but dance. So for me, it was, I had to give up piano. I had to give up horseback riding. I had to give up skiing. I had to give up. I was a tomboy, um, biking, you know, all of that. So no, do all of the things, do more of really what lights you up. It makes you even better as an artist. That's. And I I feel a lot of people get passion and purpose confused as well. Is that they think I've got to find my passion. I've got to find my passion. But ultimately, when you find your purpose, your passion comes naturally and you're able to pursue your purpose through all of your passion. Mm. And that's what I think I'm lucky with is that I've been able to know my purpose and passion from a young age. So I've been able to pursue it how I saw it in my head. Mm. Beautiful. Do you schedule your day? Very much so. My calendar and I are best friends. (laughs) So, um. Walk me through a little bit, because that's definitely something I see as essential for being um, not only multi-passionate in your pursuit, but also able to take, mm, to be more productive. It is a productivity thing. Like I've eliminated the word busy from my vocabulary. I only say I'm being productive or I'm not productive, like either day but sometimes being resting is actually productivity yes. side note um with my calendar everything's color-coded and I don't co- I'm I'm also a feeling energetic kind of person so everything's color-coded into how I want to feel when I'm completing that task so for example all of my work related things are color-coded in a different color of blue because I want to feel calm when I'm doing it and I want to enjoy the process um, anything that's purple on my calendar which is my favorite color is anything that's for me specifically or for my own business and then green is for my family and then orange is for things that need like immediate attention that aren't related to any of those facets and then yellow is for any appointments like if I have to go to the hairdressers or get my lashes done or whatever it is so yeah. everything's color-coded um gonna feel good um so in, everything's color coded in my calendar. Um, so for example, and then I also have my affirmations um, in there three times a day, which are in purple. So that I remind myself, because I know what times of days where I need that extra boost. And so I've scheduled my affirmations to be at those times of day in order to remind me why I'm here doing what I'm doing. Um, so my morning, I guess, would be I'd wake up. I'm in, I don't like, Ever since COVID, for some reason, I've not needed an alarm. Like my body clock, my circadian rhythm has found its cycle again. Um, so I generally wake up at around 5 or 5.30 a.m. And then I'll meditate. Yeah, my body's funny. Oh, um, no, me my, too. Uh, I never have it by. Yeah, get it. Yeah, totally get it. and then um, I meditate um, to meditation music for 15 to 20 minutes. And it's often just to get anxiety out of my body or any fear or any Thing that I feel will limit me through the day and then um, I ask myself the question how do I want to feel today and whatever thought or emotion that is um, I play a song that replicates that so that way because m- music is so vital <laughs> like for everyone but especially for dancer like I use that to move and so I use that song to I guess like wake my body up into how I want to feel and it's not always like I want to feel happy like sometimes it's like I want to feel calm so I'll play like a piano classic music to um, make me feel calm um, so whatever the song is um, and then I'll generally like say my affirmations then I'll wake up and I'll do a little stretch and then have a shower get ready and then have breakfast normally I train before breakfast as well I like go for a walk or go to the gym or do handstands um, whatever <laughs> I'm feeling that day um, and then after that I'll get into work mode so sometimes I'll be either studying for a two or three hour block and then I'll have a break I'll go move my body to just like break up that energy 
um, then I'll come back and I'll do a different work block and it will normally be like one of the companies that I work for. Um, then I'll have some time to just like talk to a friend, whether it's through social media or because a lot of my friends live overseas. So I had a lot of FaceTime, a lot of WhatsApp. Um, and then I will generally have dinner and then I'll watch like either a YouTube inspirational video or sometimes if I need something lighthearted, I'll just watch a show on Netflix. Um, and then I'll go into another work block and then I cut myself off always at around 8.30 p.m. ish. Um, and then use that time to wind down, whether it's have a shower. Um, sometimes I have dance classes as well in the evening. So I'll go to class and just like get on that high um, that you get from a dance class and then come home and have a big stretch. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of like around about my average day. And every now and then I'll have business meetings or I have appointments. And I just kind of I love having a digital calendar because it's so easy to move things. You don't need to cross something out and then change it over and cross it out. Like my mum's a did she likes the paper and writing, but I'm a digital person. I have been since I think I've been using my calendar since I was 13. And I've had this color coding system since then and it's worked for me and it continues to work for me. And so yeah, that's that's kind of my day in a nutshell. <laughs> well, but that's how you set yourself up for success, right? So I think it, it is. is so important to understand that we are not waking up motivated no some some people may but it is not the norm like that is work work something you invest in yourself right well we get to decide how we feel we get to decide what our day looks like and that is that and and as an artist as a dancer oh my gosh I was so much in that victim mentality (laughs) of like it's everybody else's job to tell me how I'm supposed to feel and what my day is going to look like where if I had known all of these tools prior the meditation the reading setting intentions journaling gratitude all of that prior to to me stepping out of the world it would have made such a huge difference in my career and I think that's where today's generation can actually oh, tap into so much more and I see that's some really of them starting to um it's aligning your habits with where you want to go right it's not the exactly. 8 30 rolling around the and, and hitting snooze one more time. I was like, oh, hey, I can be in the studio at 10. I'll make it if I snooze 10 more minutes. It, it sets you A up for, mm, how do you say that the best way? I think it's about planning a life that you're excited for. That's yeah. what it comes down to. And not and waiting for somebody else to exactly direct and it al- for you. And allowing yourself to have that freedom to move things is that you've, you've created this life, like you've earned it. And I think that's what people forget is that they keep working so hard towards this end goal that they end up in the process forgetting what their end goal is and so having those moments of affirmations gratitude and journaling allow you to come back to your strong why allow you to come back to your purpose and therefore you can attain your end goal a lot faster and it's never an end goal because there's always something there's always something but allowing yourself to accept that in life is where I think a lot of people limit themselves is that I go, okay, like well, how many people you'll see so many podcasts and YouTube videos about, oh, I got my billion dollar business, but I feel unfulfilled. And it's because the process to get there is because they didn't, they didn't acknowledge it the whole way of why they were doing what they were doing. And I feel that's where planning comes. Like it's so simple. People are like, oh, I, I put 15 minutes in the day for myself. Like I feel so weird. But if you put 15 minutes in your day for yourself every single day, like that's over an hour a week just for you to be you and like it's, it's literally that simple but simplicity is often I guess downgraded in life and everyone's like oh it's got to be more complicated than that but it's not it's literally 15 minutes of your day to yeah. set your intentions and to say what you're grateful for so start with 15 and you end up with an hour and it also it's the compound effect right like we're when, yeah. when you just look at how how the training is um, really organize it over and over and over again the same thing but you got to get yes. it so you can build yeah. up right um, yeah. I, I find there's so many parallels but I feel that dancers in particular are not good beginners again in something uh-huh. new 
it's a huge ego thing as well ah like, <laughs> yes you, you really have to <laughs> I just like that I was like no. <laughs> it is it yeah. is like how many people and I think it comes down to competition as well like who are you competing against are you competing against yourself or you can compete against people in the room and yeah let the people around you motivate you but don't let their success want you to pull them down like bring yourself up you don't need to pull them down to bring yourself up like use them as a platform just to keep going up and up and up and like that a big lesson I learned I guess I think I was like 10 someone said it to me it was like being the best in the room is the worst thing because then you have nowhere to go because if you're the best in the room only you can like I guess be better than yourself and so having someone better than you is not only someone to look up to but it's also to provide that imagination of where you can go also if you're the best in the room it is not your room anymore you need to find another room love that absolutely agree all right Josie thank you so much my gosh that was (laughs) hmm so I just want to point this out it it really matters on how much you actually see yourself as important in fulfilling your dreams. It is so important to not listen to what the outside wants you to be, but understanding that you are in charge, you're sitting in that driver's seat and nobody else is driving your life. No, 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 no. There is such belief in, and I've read it yesterday again, and I had to really swallow hard. Um, you know, you getting the job has so much to do with luck. And I do not, I don't agree with that statement at all. You getting the job is because you created it. And if you don't get the job, it is not for you. It may not for you right now. It may be opens the door for you something completely different than you're supposed to do. Or there is just one step in the middle that you're going to take or have to take. It's protecting you perhaps as well. You know, it's not that you're not good enough. Maybe it's not good enough for you. And I think I love that. We, we underestimate the power of knowing ourselves, knowing our triggers. Um, it's not about the outside and everything about the inside. I 100% agree. You can't live in a body that you're not happy with. No. You can't live no. in a soul that you're not happy with. So feed your soul and feed your mind and then you'll propel forward. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, Where can we find you? Um, You can find me on Instagram. It's probably the best thing. Um, My Instagram handle is just dance Josie. Um, And that was literally out of this is random story, but I got offered a full scholarship out of high school to study um, commerce at university. And then I also got offered a position in performing arts school. And so I created that Instagram when I was making that decision because I told myself well, what you want to do at the end of the day is dance. So just dance Josie is my Instagram handle because it came out of the decision to just dance first. Mm-hmm. Like, remember that that's your passion. I love it. <laughs> okay. So go follow her there. Um, and yes, so I don't have, i my cup is full, like just having this conversation mm-hmm. with you, um, just, really anchored in for me that what we're doing every day and even if it's tiny little bits it always will push us forward even if it's not one percent but maybe it's 0.5 or 0.7 it all matters because it's in the it's in the journey and not in the goal right I think it's who we become while we're achieving the goals I would say yeah yeah. Exactly. And every journey is intended for you. So yeah. accept it and take it as it comes. Mm, love it. All right, my dear. Thank you so much. Thanks for Thank listening, you, everybody. Bye. Till next time. Thank you so much for listening. If this message resonates with you, please pass it on to someone who needs to hear this right now. And if you like what you've heard, your feedback will go a very long way. If you just take 30 seconds and leave me a five-star review, that would mean the world to me. Till next time, point at yourself to rise to all that you are capable of.